What is going on, Diesel Nation? We're excited to have you guys with us today on the Diesel Podcast. If you're watching this on YouTube and aren't subscribed, make sure and click the subscribe button, like, comment, let's know about the episode. If there's a particular guest or topic that you guys would like to hear about, we're always checking comments on YouTube and love to be able to take what you guys suggest and then be able to get them onto future episodes. Today, I'm going to be joined by Eric from East Texas Extreme Driveline. And I really wanted to chat with him today about driveline failures that trucks can have and some of the things that he's seen in the shop and also ways that we can avoid it, whether through maintenance or through upgrades to not have a, a failure, be stuck on the side of the road or have, have a lot of downtime. So I'm definitely looking forward to chatting with him today. Before we get to it, though, I want to remind you our friends over at Kershaw Knives have a 20% off site wide code for you. Just use code 23diesel20 at kershaw.kaiusa.com. It's a great way to save some money, get some really cool gear. So if you're in the market for something with hunting, fishing, EDC, something around the house or job site, they've definitely got you covered. 2023 has been a huge year for Kershaw Knives. They've had a bunch of releases this year. And one of the newest are the Duralock models, which the the blade, the way that the mechanism works, it keeps your fingers away from it. Super smooth really positive feel to it. The blade's made out of D2 steel, and there's also different designs for blade shape and also handles as well. So if you're in the market, definitely make sure, head on over, check them out, and use code 23diesel20 for 20% off site-wide. All right, let's get to today's podcast with Eric, chatting with him about drive lines, failures, um, common things that he sees there in the shop, and ways that we can avoid them. Eric, welcome to the Diesel Podcast. I, uh, I really appreciate you reaching out to us on Instagram with uh, you know, some information, some things that you wanted to see, and then I was looking at your Instagram page and then this light bulb just went off. You work on drive lines, work at four by four shop, you know, you, you own this business and I haven't really covered it that much. And there's so many times I've heard people say, Oh, I've had an issue with this part or that part. And it just got me thinking, Hey, are there ways people can avoid this? What should they do? What are some common things you see there in the shop? So I appreciate your time today chatting with us and uh, look forward to learning more. Yeah, appreciate you reaching out and giving me the opportunity to come and talk to you. I've definitely listened to quite a few of your podcasts, never been on one, but, you know, never thought I'd be doing this. <laughs> <laughs> They're not that bad. It's kind of like I just walk into the shop and just got questions for you. Um, yeah. I wanted to start a little bit to learn more about your business, which I know what you do, but I don't know like how, how it started, where exactly you guys are located, how you came into being um been working on drive lines for you know four wheel drives on, on trucks all t- all kinds of vehicles really right um so really we've actually only t- technically been in business for the last what uh, august so eight months um kind of just in december it, it's, it's always been something i wanted to do was run my own shop um kind of have that freedom of my own to really take care of the customer. That was kind of my big thing. You know, I've been in the automotive business for about 10 years now, uh, dealership, stuff like that, mostly Dodge, Master Tech through Dodge. And, uh, you know, I've seen a lot of the good, but then a lot of the bad that comes with this industry and how it can get a really bad name. And so being able to kind of run things the way I wanted to kind of push me in that realm. And then, uh, We've actually we're located out in East Texas, Northeast Texas. I should be specific because people hear East Texas and they think Austin or Houston or something like that. And I'm about we're about an hour and a half away from uh, Louisiana border. So and we can get Oklahoma borders an hour and a half. Arkansas borders an hour and a half. So we're up there. Uh, if they're in the area, you know, Tyler Longview, both an hour from us. So that's about where we're located at. But uh. About halfway through, about two years into being at uh, through Dodge, started working on diesel trucks. Never really thought I would enjoy it. We had both diesel techs kind of leave within a week of each other, and we didn't have any diesel techs. So I was like, I'll, I'll take a shot at it. Let me start working on them and things like that, and kind of fell in love with them there. Um, of course, working Dodge, we get a lot of Jeeps. Being here in East Texas, there's a very large Jeep community, um, a lot of trails, off-road, stuff like that. <clears throat> so got to play around with a lot of that, doing, just having fun with a lot of lift kits, you know, all the stuff that Jeepers like to do. And uh, so, yeah, about uh, December of last year, we kind of, me and the wife got to talk and we're like, you know what, let's just, let's just start throwing it out there and see, you know, we'll start it off as kind of a, a side gig and 
you know, make a little extra money. It'll all go back into the business and actually been surprised about how much work we've actually been getting. Um, a- it makes it for a very long day and a long week when you work from seven thirty to five and then six to nine to <laughs> the side with <laughs> as well. So that's very but, cool though. That's a lot to take on and it's definitely an accomplishment to do. And we talk about a lot on the podcast and I'll ask really successful people in automotive, sometimes other industries, like how'd you do it or what tips would you give? So I didn't know that about you. So it's really cool to hear you took that leap, took that jump. I know mm-hmm. it can be scary and there's a lot of different pressures, but the thing that really stuck with me is you talked about taking care of the customer. <clears throat> One of the common things that I have seen with really successful companies in automotive is that's at the foundation of what they do. And I've seen a bit of it myself in my history is just how personal vehicles are to people, whether it's something they enjoy, like you mentioned, Jeeps, Jeeps and off-roading mm-hmm. and it's a passion for them or it's a work truck. I'm sure you, there's tons of them in Texas and all over the country where it's making them money all the time and it gets really personal. So when you can find a shop and establish a relationship with one, whether it's for passion, hobbies, or your livelihood, mm-hmm. and there's trust that they have, it, it's just, it's it's when it really works well. It's when it's an awesome relationship. And I'm sure, you know, when I think back to some things that I maybe wasn't directly involved in, but just stories I heard, and I felt like somebody got the raw, raw end of the deal. It, it you know, they got kind of shortchanged a bit and I felt bad for them. And that's where a lot of the motivation for this stuff comes from to step out there. It's like, I want to take care of people. I want to, you know, provide for my family, pursue something I enjoy, but combine all these things. Well, and especially it's where we're at. I mean, we're in a town of 3,800 people, you know, so it's a very small town, tight knit community, but they're all farmers. Their oil riggers, their ranchers, their trucks are their livelihood. You know what I mean? So if they get, you know, ripped off on a job on their truck, you know, it sets them back a lot more than somebody who's, you know, it's just their it's their third or fourth vehicle and it's just a toy that they play with here and there. Yeah. So you know, you really want to try to, you know, you want to do a good job. You know, you it's a business. You still got to make the money, but there's what I think there's better ways to do it than what I've seen to where you can still make an income while making sure that they're taken care of properly. I've been thinking about this episode since we chatted and I don't know a whole lot about it. I, I, the only thing I really know of drivelines is when somebody had something go wrong, you know, and I, I I mentioned a few examples earlier, like something going on with the drive shaft or you joint cracks, a transmission case or, they never service their differential. It was like this, you never had to service part of the truck and then we have this catastrophic issue. I wanted to ask you, what are some things we should think about? And I'm sure it might vary a little bit between Ford, GM and Ram, but there might be some common things. What do you see a lot in the shop for failures? Um, maintenance is huge. Uh, making sure, especially now with all the limited slip differentials that they have, the you know, they're trying to fancy them up now on the back end and things like that. A lot of them take special additives. They don't just take a general gear fluid. But not only that, but making sure that wherever shop you're going to does a proper service on it. I've actually seen a lot of shops where all it is is they just stick a hose in it, suck all the fluid out, throw a new fluid in, and then you're down the road and just spend 150 bucks where you're not cleaning it out. You're not getting any of the debris, the metal and things like that out of there. <clears throat> so you're with all bearings and stuff in there, which are your main failure points. You're asking for failure. Um, I know you, U-joints are a big thing and they, they don't, with the U-joints, it's definitely become an issue because they don't, you, you can't maintain them anymore. Most of them don't come greasable anymore or anything like that. So, you know, if they're non-greasable, it's just kind of a, wait until it happens but on the the differential side could you walk us through what is a proper what's a proper service in general what are some things that we should look for or ask if we're not doing it ourselves or maybe we are doing it ourselves and want to tackle it in our garage what should we be doing i mean it's fairly simple the cover should be pulled off the if you have a gasket god bless you because you're going to make your life a whole lot easier uh, if you have to use silicone, you better make sure to clear off the the surface, make sure all the silicone is cleared off, and then using some sort of, whether it's brake cleans, they have 
uh, different chemicals and stuff, but actually pressurized cleaner or a brush or something of that effect actually run through. Because if you ever pull the case, the front cover off of a differential, you take a can of brake clean and start spraying it down, you will watch the color change from all of the old fluid, all the metal material, because it's still a metal on metal and things like that. So you can actually watch it change color. So just getting in there and making sure to get all the crevices as best you can. Are you going to get every bit of it? No, it's like doing a you know, fluid change and filter change on a transmission. Are you going to get every little bit of it? No, but you clean it out properly. You know, do a basic inspection of your gears. Um, you can see the pinion gear as long as the tires are up, you can spin them. Checking both sides of the ring gear teeth to make sure there's no pitting anything like that you'll little discolorations fairly normal but any kind of pitting or anything like that that's when you kind of want to start looking at maybe uh you know refurbishing that rear end sw swapping the ring and pinion gear out changing out your bearings because if your ring gear and pinion gear is so pitting that definitely means your bearings are probably pitting already as well i don't know i don't know if this is uh a loaded question or not because I'm, <laughs> I'm naive when it comes to this but do you ever see failures on differentials way before even the first service? Like if somebody's towing really heavy or they're taking it to a drag strip or they're off-roading a lot, is that common or is it something you hit with a mileage? I can't say it's a common thing, but I also can't say that it's not uncommon either. Um, if you start getting into high horsepower and things like that, you're definitely going to see guys doing stuff. Uh, a lot of it is just ignorance and not knowing maybe how to drive to perform certain activities. I remember being when I was first wrenching and uh, I was only about three and a half years, four years into actually being a mechanic and uh, got this blazer that came in. They said, yeah, the, you know, differential came apart. Uh, Went to go pull it in. I was like, okay, thinking, you know, no big deal. And I go stacking it up. I actually watched the axles start to come out of the back differential, the actual housing, wow. as I'm trying to roll it. And uh, pull the cover off, and it just, it was fully grenaded. And you know, talking to the customer, they're like, yeah, we were just out four-wheeling, you know, just having some fun. Basically, he uh, caught a little bit of air, had his foot fully on the pedal, and when that tire hit the ground it stopped and the just destroyed that differential. So I can't, I can't say it's a common thing. Um, I'm a little curious. I've got a, uh, 2020, uh, front diff that I just tore apart at the dealership. And it's, uh, that's a fairly new truck, you know, not low miles. It's still about 80,000 miles. But when I went to go do just a pinion seal on it, no big deal. I grabbed that rear flange and I could literally move it in and out and up and down. And I went like, so I'm a little curious. I'm still waiting to hear from the customer, but I'm wondering if that can be an issue because anytime you lose any kind of tension, especially on the pinion gear, it's just a matter of time before that thing's going to be destroyed. I imagine it gets pretty, uh, pretty pricey too, depending, <laughs> depending on the carnage that happens. Oh, right, yeah, definitely. Especially, it, you know, through uh covid and all that kind of stuff that doesn't help parts pricing in any which way with uh with drive shafts that's another one that i just wanted to ask you about a little bit like is that i guess when i've heard issues with it it might be more performance related i guess is there's more than stock power there's something going on and and you have a failure you know that way what are i mean do you see those very often is it, does it tend to be on certain types of trucks? Are there things that people should think about? You know, say, I just say like a older 5.9 or something like that, making a ton of power, compound turbos, all that kind of stuff. Are there options for stronger, better drive shafts, something they should consider? Oh, a ton of options. If, you, if you're running compound turbos in a stock drive shaft, you're, you're not doing it right. Because um, <laughs> that thing is not going to hold up to nothing. Um yeah, going, depending on exactly what you're trying to do, you know, because you're always, especially if, 
because if you're let's say you're trying to drag race or something like that while you want to have plenty of strength and ability to where you're not going to twist that drive shaft you know into a torque wrench or something like that you want to be able to also have some sort of stability to it as well um i mean that's with any kind of performance vehicle you're going to have something i know they do a lot of aluminum based drive shafts and things like that that really kind of that'll hold up to that power while also giving you that extra light weight. Now, generally the high performance isn't what I deal with or see a whole lot of, you know, especially out here in the sticks, it's all work trucks. But I will say when it comes to drive shafts, specifically um, the two shaft drive sh drive shafts is where you see a lot of issues. And mostly it's, it, it again, comes back to maintenance. Um, there's that slip gear in the middle of that two shaft drive shaft that nobody ever thinks about and uh, Ford's having some issues with their two where it's actually creating a bump anytime you come to a stop and a lot of guys weren't being able to figure it out and it's just a, a basic tear it apart regrease it put a new clamp on it put it back together it's something that takes an hour and a half it's super simple and it's going to save you a lot of hassle in the long run um the drive shafts themselves i don't see a lot of issues with but the U-joints and the drive shafts, you know, we kind of come back to not being able to grease them and things like that. Um, so you end up, especially these trucks running in all the dirt and grime if they're on the old rigs or if they're running through pastures chasing cows and things like that. The other thing I see a lot is any of the lifted trucks. I know you just did one recently talking about lift kits, suspensions, and doing yeah. those properly. And that kind of comes back to, it got me thinking to what I do and what I'm looking at. And it was like, you know, they do the same thing where they'll put a lift kit. The suspension looks great, but then they don't drop that drive shaft down. So now you've got this excessive angle on that U-joint, putting twice as much strain on it or even causing vibration problems and things like that that a lot of times they don't think about. Yeah, I think, and that was one of the things that I was really interested in chatting with you about because it's kind of started me recently on this kind of journey to look into other things with trucks that I know I've probably missed over the years, but I really wanted to cover them because our, our audience is so diverse with what they're into, whether it's off-roading, racing, fuel mileage, longevity, <clears throat> all that kind of stuff. And I wanted to take these other parts of the trucks and, and really focus on them to, to better understand. And one of the really interesting things you brought up right before we were chatting was about how driveline failures damage other parts. And I had mentioned, you know, my experience with it was maybe like a track, uh, a crack transmission case or an overdrive housing mm -hmm. and how bad it sucked for people to have to, you know, the overdrive housing wasn't too bad to buy, but if you needed a whole new case and trying to source it and how old the transmissions right. are, it'd be hard to find. But what are some things you see with other parts that failure that fail when something's going on with the drive line? Right. Um, the main thing for sure is, you know, everybody, you know, everybody wants to talk down the 68 RFE. And I actually really like the transmission. I've built a couple of dealership, things like that. But uh, these guys, you know, everybody wants to put the bigger tire, bigger wheel on their trucks and make it look cool and things like that. But they don't think about, you know, those out of stock, those rear differentials are geared at like a three nine. And when you're running 80 miles an hour down the freeway like that with the, the, all that weight and those extra big tires and wheels, it actually ends up putting a lot more strain on the transmission, not necessarily the rear differential. And it only being like a five clutch, gear back there on that overdrive going that speed it just cooks them up um and you know no uh, that was one thing that was interesting especially my wife has a 17 forerunner that you know we put a lift kit on just a little three inch lift kit upsized tires and stuff and that was the next thing i looked at was okay what gear ratio is she running now what does she need how does it drive you know it can it can cause a lot of extra strain on other on a, the transmission more specifically and then uh so just doing a bait i mean i say doing a basic re-gear uh that's not always the cheapest thing to do but if you're still wanting some longevity not only that but if you want the vehicle to operate 
better. Uh, same thing with, you know, the last one with the suspension. He talks about the way it drives. And you can tell the difference between doing a stack versus actually doing a $900 kit. Yeah, it's a little bit more, but it operates better. It's kind of the same way with that rear diff. You rear, rear gear it. Now your engine's not screaming down the road while you're doing 80 miles an hour. The weight is no longer on that transmission, that overdrive gear. It is now back on the rear differential. And that rear differential is going to take a lot more abuse than that, you know, five-year clutch and that. And, I mean, <clears throat> whether it's the 68 or, you know, whether it's the 6R140 in the Ford or any of that, doing a rear gear just it, – it, it allows the truck to work at a better pace than letting it screen the way – just throwing wheels and tires on it, you know? Yeah, that was that was one of the – things over the years when I would do an episode or chat with a transmission builder about 68 RFEs, they would name like three things that always kill them. One was power. Two was not doing maintenance. A huge one was not re-gearing because yeah. wheels and tires are such a huge part of, it's like the first thing we do to a truck and yeah. you have lower line pressures, you have the lower RPMs, and then you're asking it to hold up to you know, this, basically just more strain. And I know it can be tough with the price of re-gearing, but it's definitely cheaper than bu buying a new transmission or an aftermarket one that's upgraded. And y you're still not guaranteed to not break it, <clears throat> even, you know, doing a, you know, stronger transmission, you know, something in the aftermarket, if you're still running the same gearing. So I think that's something right. definitely, definitely I've heard about on the transmission side. Yeah. And it still puts a lot of strain, even on the engine. You know, if you, if you've, if, if it's not geared properly, you know, and you can even get better towing, better fuel economy. All those things kind of matter once you start doing this rear gear. And I mean, I say it's expensive, but I mean, like you just said, if the cost of rebuilding a 68 RFE and trying to build it up versus, and I've looked it up, it's about the cost of a, a front and rear differential regear set. It's about 1500 bucks, not including labor. I mean, it's not, it's kind of it's it's pretty even if not probably less to do because i know it doesn't take quite as long <laughs> to re-gear a differential <laughs> than it does to rebuild a transmission so i mean in a way you're still going to be saving money in that aspect the do you find because it, it sounds like you work on a lot of different kinds of vehicles and i go back to the the jeep side because it's something i think a lot of us have either some direct or indirect experience in we either had a buddy that really loved to do it or somebody in our family and just my limited knowledge is regearing on that side is really common. Something they expect, something they know they want to do. Um, something they've done a lot of research on. And on the diesel truck side, mm -hmm. for the longest time, it was almost an afterthought. It was, let me do big air, big fuel tuning. Let me get all this stuff dialed in. I'm going to keep the stock 392s in there. That's cool. Um, but I, I, I think it started to get a little bit more out there that, hey, this is a big part of not just keeping your transmission alive, but the response. Um, the drivability, you know, of the truck being there. Yeah. I think when you start getting into the higher performance, I think they've got it well keyed in now. They've, they've kind of got that part figured out. Um, but down on the, on the street side, when you go talking to, you know, a high school student who's building up his first diesel and just kind of getting into it or, you know, the guy that's got his daily driver that he wants to put a four inch lift on it was, you know, sevens and all this other stuff. Like those are still the people that still haven't, they, you know, they're not in it. They, they like it, but they're not in it enough to understand all the other components that interact with that. Yeah. And, uh, those are the ones I think educating the customer is the biggest thing that shops can do to, not only benefit the customer, benefit themselves. If you can educate the customer into understanding why these things matter, instead of just, uh, well, it'll make your truck run better, understanding that this is going to save you money in the long run to get it done right, whether it's, again, fuel economy performance or damaging other components. You know, the more education we can get out there, I think it benefits everybody in the industry. I think back to being a younger truck owner, and I think back to how I viewed everything. It's a tough sell because at that time, what I wanted, if I was going to spend two grand or 2,500, 
I wanted to be able to go over to my friends and pop the hood and show them, you know, the, the turbo. I wanted to be able to take him for a ride and he could hear it, see it, you know, all that kind of stuff. Oh, yeah. And even with transmissions, it gets, it gets like that. Like, unless you're really into it, I don't see a lot of guys that say, Hey man, let me swing by. You totally gotta <clears throat> go for a ride, fill my transmission, fill the lockup. They don't really just people really hardcore yeah. into it, do it. And it's kind of the same thing with the gearing, but with experience and people like yourself and, and all that you've seen and, and all that you work on, you guys are telling us, Hey, this is going to cost you a lot of money. Um, and it's better to think about it now before you go do all these nice things with a single turbo or compound turbo and your injectors and all these other things that you want to do. You're going to spend a ton of money and have to delay that longer if you're blowing up transmissions or your differentials or you're not servicing it correctly. And I think that's the, that's the key is just understanding that part of it, which when I was younger, I didn't hear that talk. I just heard, you know, <laughs> air, fuel, go fast, tuning, go have fun. Yeah, I don't know how many how many of us at a at a young age really heard a whole lot other than what we wanted to hear. So, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I will say this: like you know, even with the U joints and stuff, you know, because when we when we brought up doing this podcast, it kind of got me started thinking about stuff. And uh, it's the one thing I haven't seen yet that I heard about was. Cause the one big main failure that I, that I see when it comes to U joints is actually the front axles. So especially on the Dodges. So they have that basically it's in three wheel drive the whole time it's running down the road. Cause they have that front axle disconnect and uh, those U joints on the front are always going out. And then I heard about a year ago about how you can swap in the locking, almost a Ford style locking axle onto the dodges i've yet to see anybody doing anything with that to kind of combat that failure rate on the ball joints and the u joints and the front differential and stuff like that because i mean you can run that forward front differential a hundred thousand miles and never do an old chain it'll look brand the old will look brand new in that front diff because it's not rotating constantly the dodges they don't run it that way so it's constantly moving all the time which is you know more maintenance because you got to change that fluid out regularly, even if you're not going into four wheel drive ever. So that'd be, that'd be, that'd be something that, you know, if you're in the area, I'll do it. I'll put them in. Let's see it. Because, you know, I think that'd be really cool to kind of see one of those trucks that actually somebody modifies it in that way to, you know, give it a little bit of a step up. So they're not having to replace U joints every two, three years. What would you say are three? It could be even more than three, but maybe three common things that you wish truck owners either knew or were prepared for when they came to your shop, whether it was, I know you touched on the maintenance side, but maybe knowing how they're going to use their truck or being more descriptive with what they do or, or what are just three things that, that we all should think about, um, you know, as it pertains to drive lines, suspension, differentials. Um, yeah, definitely more descriptive on what you're doing with the truck. The more descriptive, the better. For some reason, I find when customers come, they they feel like the less they tell you, the cheaper it's going to be. And it kind of works the opposite. The less you tell me, the more I got to chase stuff down. Or in that case, especially if you're trying to upgrade something, I'm, I, I may not put the right upgrade in there because I don't know exactly what you're doing with it. Um definitely the mileage and maintenance schedules. Um, you know, I know they, I know they're putting the owner's manual in the vehicles, but I'm pretty sure they're all still in the plastic 10 years later. Nobody reads them anymore, but knowing your maintenance schedules and then knowing that there's a difference between a basic maintenance schedule and a extreme use maintenance schedule. Like right now, for especially transmissions, diffs, oils, any of these fluids in East Texas, it's, you know, 108 degrees with a hundred percent humidity. It's hot. And then you run in 80 miles an hour down the freeway or out here in the country. Basically you're never going lower than 60 miles an hour, anywhere you go. These fluids are taking a beating and to maybe not postpone those, those maintenances quite so much and to keep up with them long run you're going to save yourself a ton of money you know and i don't think people realize 
how much money, you know, yeah, yeah you're going to spend it now, but wait until you got to rebuild one because it blew up or you got to replace bearings or a transmission, you know? And then, uh, I think at this point, the one thing I've noticed is that understanding that parts are not, parts are not as easy to come by as they yeah. were three years ago. There's still some, there's still some of those customers who, you know, think it's everything's right down the road. And while some of it may be down the road, it's not always the best product to put in the vehicle. So sometimes that extra day or two to get the right part to do the job right to make sure it's not going to fail a year from now sometimes it's worth the wait i thought it, i had a conversation with uh, somebody not too long ago and we were talking about like our grandfathers and mm -hmm. how they always save stuff and you know like they they wanted to keep these things and have them as spares or, or rebuild things and I, growing up i always thought that was weird because i'm like well you can just go to the auto parts store you can just go here and get it mm -hmm. And most of my adult life was spent where if you needed a part, there might be a lead time of a week, maybe two weeks. A lot of the stuff, depending on what it is, you could get it really quick. If you wanted to pay for overnight, you pay for overnight. Right. But over the last three years, everybody's dealt with, sometimes this stuff isn't in stock for six months. Sometimes there is no ETA. Um, sometimes right. you can't get it. And it's so like we've all had to change really quick. And I, that's why I was thinking back to like my grandfather would save everything and rebuild stuff. Like, why did he do that? Well, there was probably a time when he was living, you know, growing up and stuff or just yeah. doing stuff where it was, it was like that. Um, and so I think that's a really key part of what you mentioned and it, how it translates to somebody with a 2023 truck or 2020 or 2017 or any truck is that maintenance schedule and trying to make those mm -hmm. components last as long as they can. So if you can avoid being in a situation where your truck's down forever, you have to use sub quality parts just to get it on the road and be right back in the same position. It's not right. Fun. Well, and especially with, cause I'm, I'm looking at some of these maintenance schedules that they're pushing now, still being at the dealership, I'm still seeing what they're doing now. And I'm seeing 10, 12, 15,000 miles on oil changes and things like that on these newer trucks. And all I can think in my head is just like, man, these engines are not going to last, you know? So I think looking at what, the maintenance schedule is, is all fine and dandy, but again, knowing how you're using the truck, knowing what it's going through, looking at the conditions where you're at, you know, whether it's extreme cold or extreme hot, knowing those things and knowing the difference, or if you don't know the difference, ask, you know, I know, I, I, and I don't know if it's an intimidation thing or whatever, but I would much rather a customer ask because I'm never going to judge to think, oh, you don't know what you're talking about. You know, that's what I'm supposed to be here for. I'm here. I'm the one that's supposed to know. You don't have to know it. I have to know it. Yeah. You know, so to come ask me is like, hey, when should I do this? How how often should I put this off for and doing things like that? Like ask the questions to keep that vehicle running as long as humanly possible or to keep the components running as long as possible. I really like how you mentioned <clears throat> telling you wish people would tell you give you the most descriptive way they can of what they're doing with the truck because I kind of chuckled to mm -hmm. myself because I, I, I don't know if it's human nature, but we think we go, Oh, I'm just driving the truck. It's going to be cheaper for us. It's not going to be as expensive. There's not going to be all these add ons and it, it goes like that with transmissions, <laughs> engine builds, yep. all that kind of stuff. And I never really thought about how <clears throat> it could snowball into costing me more in the long run versus saying, Hey, I take this to the drag strip maybe once a month during the summer. Other than that, mm -hmm. I'm driving my toe to this trailer every now and then. I'm thinking about going to this four-inch suspension lift. I'm thinking about 37s. Mm -hmm. um, what do I need versus, oh, I'm, you know, I'm just going to be driving. I just need, you know, something a little better fuel economy. I'll be good. And then you're seeing me right. again. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I see that a lot when it comes down to I'm having an issue with my vehicle and – I need you to diagnose it. And, you know, let's say it's, it's got a vibration or something like that. You're driving down the road, you feel the, you know, you're feeling it, but you're looking it over. You're not really seeing anything. And then you call the customer back. It's like, is there anything happening recently? Oh, well, yeah. Now that you mention it, I did, you know, smack into a, into a curb the other day at like 20 miles an hour 
on the rear side because I hit some ice on the side of the road. So I don't know if that has anything to do with it. And then you find a bent axle and you're like, well, that would have been much useful information two days ago while I was sitting here chasing something. <laughs> that was, <laughs> you know, that I could have been like, oh, okay, pull it off. It's right there. There we go. You know, and it, it and I don't know what it, I, like you said, I don't know if it's human nature or what it is, but it's almost they like they want to, the less information they give, then it's not going to cost them as much. Yeah. The, you had mentioned additives earlier and I wanted to ask you about that with the differentials. What, like what your range trucks, which ones, which ones need that? So now they've been doing limited slip for quite a while now, but I know specifically for Dodge because that's the one I'm most familiar with. Basically anything over a 15 for sure has to have either an additive limited slip additive already that's built into the fluid itself or added on to it. Now here's the fun part. Mopar's differential fluid does not have the limited slip in it. It is a completely different bottle that you have to ask for if you want to get it. Mm -hmm. So keep that in mind if you go to your Dodge dealer, because I promise you the parts guys don't know that either. Um, but I mean, granted you can get any of this stuff and it's not like, it, cause what it ends up doing in case anybody's curious or having this issue is as you're making turns, you'll actually get almost a squeak or a shutter in the back end. So it's just not allowing that rear differential to operate the way it's supposed to. And uh, we were getting a lot of people that were coming in, they were getting rear diff services. And then all of a sudden they had a shutter. They couldn't figure out every time they make a slow turn, it was making all this noise and shuddering and everything. And, it was they were taking it to a loop center. They were sucking the fluid out, sticking fluid back in there, gear all, send them on their way, and they weren't even aware that it needed it. So, so that would be a good question. Like I probably, I definitely say if somebody's going to do a service themselves, but even if they're going to take it, you know, someplace as quick and easy, is does the fluid already have this additive in it? And if not, then I also mm -hmm. need this second bottle, which we might not think we just think, Oh, it's a Mopar fluid. This is what goes in my truck. It right. has everything I need. And I'm, I'm back on the road, but it might not be the case or isn't the case. Right. That's, that's definitely a good tip. And I think, um, you know, I know a lot of our listeners own Ram trucks, whether they're old, new. <clears throat> and so a lot of this, a lot of the things pertaining to, axles and driveline and stuff like that is really kind of helpful for them. And even, you know, people who have Fords or, or GMs is just the maintenance stuff applies regardless of what truck it is. And I think really thinking about what we're doing with the truck and then asking the shop or telling them, Hey, this is what I'm doing. What, mm -hmm. what kind of solutions you know you have for me can, can definitely apply. And I know that there's such a big topic and we could probably spend an hour on just, gears an hour on just u joints an hour on just drive shafts an hour on front suspension oh, yeah. <laughs> like all that kind of stuff so i probably didn't ask you something that somebody is curious about but if they want to reach out to you like on instagram or website or get in contact with you what's the best way to do that to be able to either ask about something or maybe they're local to you and they're like hey i, I, I didn't hear about your shop i just heard about it on the podcast um there's some things i want right. to do when, when can i stop by so if they want to get a hold of me, I'm on both Facebook and Instagram, East Texas Extreme Drive Train. Um, you can reach me, text, call at any point in time. I've always got the extra phone on me, 903-975-4272. You can call me there, ask me anything. If I don't get to you right away, I'm always doing something, so I'm very busy, but I'll definitely make sure I'm going to get back to you before the end of the day. You can hit me up on Instagram, message me on Facebook, any of those uh, website is in the process. So we're working on that one. <laughs> Very cool. I know that takes, uh, it takes a lot of time to, to kind of get it customized, you know, the, the way that you want it, but I appreciate you listening to the podcast, um, reaching out to us, giving some suggestions and then, you know, answering our questions today and just helping us understand better ways to protect our trucks or get them to perform the way that we want to. So I appreciate your, your time chatting with us and keep me updated on your business. Keep me updated as you grow. And, uh, you know, we sit back down in the future and, you know, see how all that went and how the progress and, and everything. So it's a, it's a really awesome accomplishment. And I love to hear stories of people going out there and, you know, thinking about that and, and then taking, you know, the steps to you know, be able to create their vision for, for what they want in, in automotive. 
Oh, definitely. I'll keep you updated, man. I appreciate you bringing me on and let me get to talk to you. Don't forget diesel vans. Make sure and head on over to Kershaw.kaiusa.com. Use code 23diesel20 for 20% off site-wide. It's a great way to save some money, get some really cool gear. If you need something for hunting, fishing, EDC, around the job site, around the house. They've got a bunch of a bunch of new models in 2023. And one of the latest ones are the Duralock models, which the way that the blade opens and closes is really smooth. Uh, has a real positive feel to it. Keeps your fingers away from the blade um, when you're opening and closing it. And the blade's made out of D2 steel. So if you're in the market, it's a great blade for using every day. Um, you know, something for EDC, something in a toolbox, glove box. Uh, it's a really great, uh, really great, great lineup that they have. Um, also want to give a shout out to some of our Patreon supporters, Tyler Lowe and a 23 Diesel, uh, J. Cole John, all of our other Patreon supporters, all of you who subscribe on YouTube and podcast apps and have followed us for seven years on the Diesel Podcast. We appreciate all your support and look forward to bringing you more of the content that you want to hear in 2023. Until next time, keep the shiny side up.